When it comes to popular beliefs circulated throughout those of Reformed theology, the persuasion of Calvinism has had its undeniable influence on many. Of the beliefs originated by John Calvin, a 16th century theologian and philosopher, the acronym of TULIP best defines his teachings on the predestination of the elect and non-elect. This means that no matter what you might think, you had no free will or consent in where you are going to spend the rest of eternity because God has already decided it for you. This is the belief of Calvinists. But does the Bible say the same thing? In this segment, we will be going over one of the five points of Calvinism and using the light of the scriptures to discern whether or not the idea is consistent with the Word of God. Let's begin. The first letter of the acronym TULIP represents what is called total depravity, which, in short, means that our nature is completely corrupted and is incapable of doing any good outside of God's will. Let's turn to some passages in the Bible that Calvinists will use to defend this position. Romans 3 verses 11 to 12 There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 8 verse 7 Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Ephesians 2 verse 1 And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Since we have described the meaning of total depravity, it is time to see why this point misrepresents the scriptures. To start, the words total depravity do not appear once in the Holy Bible so it must be suspected that this is based on philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of the world. If we turn to the book of Romans, we can see that God has placed in man's heart an understanding of what is good and evil that is all the while being corrupted by sin. Let's read the verses in question. Romans 2 verses 14 to 16 For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Here, we can plainly see that the law is written in the hearts of men, receiving some level of recognition within themselves when they do good or evil. It is not meant for them to justify themselves, but allows them to be convicted concerning who they are and what they have done in relation to the gospel's message. Another verse that can be used is Luke 11 verse 13, where it says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? The Lord of Glory recognized that even though a person can be evil, they are still not beyond the ability to do good acts. There are people throughout the Old Testament who were described as righteous despite being unregenerate before the Holy Ghost was given on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Take 
For instance, Jesus calling Abel righteous in Matthew 23 verse 35, John calling him righteous as well in 1 John 3 verse 12, and the author of Hebrews as well in Hebrews 11 verse 4. In Exodus 35 verses 21 to 29, the people willingly gave their treasures for the construction of the tabernacle, and the scriptures even call the women who spun curtains for the tabernacle wise-hearted. Even Lot, a man who had pitched his tents in front of Sodom and Gomorrah, and had been coerced into sleeping with his own two daughters, was called righteous according to 2 Peter 2 verses 7 to 8. If these unregenerate Old Testament Jews were able to do good willingly, then total depravity needs to be reevaluated. In Ephesians 2 verse 1, the Calvinist likes to point out that before Christ had quickened us with his spirit, the verse says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. They love to bring up this verse, and yet they don't love bringing up passages like Colossians 3 verses 1 to 3. Let's read this passage and see why this crushes their interpretation. Colossians 3 verses 1 to 3 If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and have your life hid with Christ in God. How could we still be dead if we were made alive in Christ? Unless, of course, context matters. The following verses of Ephesians 2 reads, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. If we were walking according to the course of this world, and having our conversation in times past according to the lust of our flesh, that doesn't sound like something a dead person would do. The first three verses of Colossians 3 shows that we are to live according to the will of Christ and not according to our own will, which is corrupted by sin. As Ephesians 2 is about the new life that we have been given now since we are in Christ. Just because a person is not saved and doesn't believe in Jesus Christ doesn't mean they don't know what good is, which is why they will be condemned because they know deep down they have fallen and have rejected the absolute standard of righteousness, Jesus Christ. If they didn't know about good, they could not be held accountable, as sin is not imputed where there is no law. The philosophy of Calvinism is the result of a man trying to set rules for the word of God, dealing in half-truths to suppose a pre-existing worldview without taking the whole thing into perspective. God's will is greater than our own yet in his goodness has given us the choice to accept him or reject him, in which all must decide. <laughs>